Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming uh, today on, uh, on Halloween, no less, uh, for our event on Syria in, in the gray zone. I'm Melissa Dalton. I direct the Cooperative Defense Project here at CSIS, and I'm delighted to be joined by my distinguished colleagues uh, who served alongside of me on, on the Syria study group that really led the effort, uh, bipartisan effort mandated by Congress to review U.S. strategy, including the diplomatic and uh, military components of the, the U.S. Uh, efforts in Syria, uh, forward-looking, uh, not, not retrospective, um, but also to put Syria in the broader context of um, an ongoing effort that we have been conducting here at CSIS over the last two years, looking at gray zone competition. Um, that's the area between uh, conventional warfare and day-to-day -day statecraft whereby the United States, along with other significant act actors across the globe, are using a range of coercive tools, um, from information operations to economic levers uh, to the use of proxy forces, um, as well as in the cyber and space demand, uh, domains to extend their, their influence and, and their interests. Um, so excited to be engaging on this two-part conversation today. Um, the first part will focus on the findings of the Syria study group, and then we will transition to a panel discussion with uh, some other distinguished colleagues to, to unpack some of the dimensions of, of the Syrian conflict, um, particularly as, as we've seen the developments uh, unfold over, over the last few weeks. Before we get started today, I want to share with you our building safety precautions. Overall, we feel secure in our building, but as a convener, we have a duty to prepare for an emergency. I will serve as your responsible safety officer at this event. Please follow my instructions should the need arise. Um, finally, please take a moment to familiarize yourself with the emer emergency exit pathways for this room, which are, yes, exactly. Mike has, <laughs> has joined us for events before, so he knows where they are behind you and down the stairs, um, or if the need arises, we will exit it um, out the doors behind us. Thank you, Mike, Mike for, your, for your kind assistance. Happy to help. Um, so to, to start today, um, we are going to be uh, unpacking the findings of the Stereo Study Group with our two co-chairs. Uh, to my left is uh, Dana Stroll, who served as one of the, who served as the Democratic co-chair of the Stereo Study Group, and she is in her day job, the Shelley and Michael Kasson Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Dana's previous experience includes serving as a staff member on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, as well as uh, many years in the Department of Defense, where I had the distinct privilege of, of working with her. Um, and to my right is uh, the other distinguished co-chair of the CRSA group, the, the Republican appointee, uh, Michael Singh. Um, he serves as the managing director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, um, previously served as the senior director for Near East and North African Affairs at the White House, as well as the director for several Mi Middle Eastern countries on the NSC staff and special assistant to two secretaries of, of state. Um, so delighted to have you both joining us today. Um, so to, to open up, um, would like to ask uh, perhaps to start with Dana, based on your work through the Syria study group, what are the most significant gray zone activities in your estimation that are, Russia and Iran are currently undertaking in Syria? That's a great question. Uh, and we spent a lot of time in our report talking about the natures of Russian and Iranian support to the Assad regime. And I should say at the top, one, one, since we're talking about Russia and Iran and gray zone activities, one question we worked to tackle in the deliberations of our group is um, about the alliance between Russia and Iran in Syria and are there vulnerabilities or fractures or tensions that could be exploited by the United States uh, to divide them and then move forward with a better outcome for Syria. And our conclusion was no, not at this time, that what unites Russia and Iran in, in their commitment to the survival of Assad regime and, and his commitment to retake Syrian territory is much stronger than any of the tensions that are dividing the two entities at this point in time. Um, in terms of gray zone activities, other than Russia's overt kinetic military support for the Assad regime, what it's doing in Syria is entirely in the gray zone. Uh, two great examples are Russia, through its um, Security Council seat at the UN Security Council, consistently blocks efforts to, uh, uh, to have truth-telling commissions, um, fact-finding commissions on things, for example, like use of chemical weapons, commission of war crimes, et cetera. So Russia, 
um, consistently at the UN Security Council and in deliberations across UN bodies like the um, Organization for the Prevention of Chemical Weapons, OPCW, will block, block international bodies from undertaking those fact-finding missions, block international bodies from assigning complicity for the commission of war crimes, for the use of chemical weapons. So it's basically, no, this didn't happen, look over there, somewhere else. And another great example of Russian operations in the gray zone are its use of mercenaries, like the Wagner um, uh, organization. So basically, rather than have Russian military forces itself challenge us, there was a time where US military forces at our outpost of the Tansk garrison were challenged not by the Russians themselves, but by mercenaries, Wagner operating alongside uh, Iran proxies. Um, so, so these are examples where the Russians maintain just enough distance to be able to deny, but it's clearly different elements of the Russian state challenging and testing the United States, both our commitment, our resolve, and then actually what we're doing in Syria and where, where we're willing to draw that line. And Iran is all about gray zone activities, not just in Syria, across the region. Um, Mike, uh, I'll leave it to you to talk more about Iran. Needless to say, one thing that we really try to emphasize in our report is that when we talk about Iranian entrenchment in Syria, we're not just talking about Iranian boots, military investment in Syria. We're also talking about all the elements of Iran's soft power. So whether it's buying up real estate in Syria that's been vacated by refugees who were forced to flee Syria for a variety of reasons, whether it's transitioning religious institutions um, to Shia, Islam, whether it's paying off local tribes, these sorts of things are all elements of gray zone warfare to, to shift the, the conditions and the dynamics in Syria, but maintain just enough plausible deniability so it's unclear exactly what Iran is doing. Thanks so much, Dana, mm -hmm. for unpacking that. Mike. Well, let me say first, thank you, Melissa, and thank you to CSIS and to all of you for, um, for having us here, for, for being here. Um, happy Halloween to everybody. This is my Halloween costume. Um, it's, uh, He's a think tank nerd. It's, uh, it's real, it is a real pleasure to, to be here. Uh, although this isn't such a pleasurable topic to talk about. I'm never sure when, I'm, when we talk about the gray zone, and last time I was here we were talking about right. uh, Iranian gray zone activities elsewhere. Um, what is and what isn't in the gray zone, but maybe that's part of the point, um, uh, that it's hard to know exactly what falls into this category. But, but I think we can say that with respect to Iran, and, and I think this goes uh, to a large extent for Russia as well, but if you look at Iranian activities, there is obviously an overt conventional military aspect to what Iran is doing. Iran has sent its own um, military in relatively small numbers uh, to Syria, IRGC officers, Revolutionary Guard, that is, officers, and it has tried, um, without great success, to establish a sort of forward military presence which it could use against, say, Israel or other U.S. allies uh, in the area. And Israel has obviously engaged in an uh, air campaign to try to stymie those Iranian activities. But we also see Iran engaging in a, a host of proxy activities, mm -hmm. sending, um, whether it's Pakistani or Afghan m militants there, sending Hezbollah, sending Iraqi Shia mil militants uh, to Syria, and then also actually recruiting new militias in Syria. And one of our colleagues from the Washington Institute, Philip Smith, has a project where you can actually look at the map uh, of all these different militias that Iran uh, has created in Syria. Um, they're also engaged across the spectrum of economic activities, uh, as well as, I would say, social and political activities. So looking to purchase real estate, looking to gain contracts, um, looking to insinuate themselves into society in different ways. They've obviously been accused of trying to uh, sort of convert people from Sunni Islam to Shia Islam, although lots of those reports are a bit murky, I would say. Um, and if we move into a political phase in Syria, which maybe is ahead of us, um, then I would expect Iran to do, try to do in Syria what it has done in, say, Iraq or Lebanon, which is to also insinuate itself into the political process. Mm -hmm. uh, as Dana noted, I think we see some of the same activities uh, with respect to Russia, where you see different Syrian commanders who may owe greater allegiance to the Russians than they actually owe to the Assad regime. Um, I, I think that one of the things which is interesting about Russian and Iranian gray zone activities in Syria is that they're not only directed at uh, the other side, as it were. It's not only directed at the U.S. or the Syrian opposition or the SDF, they're directing them at one another as well. There's this competition among Russia, Iran, and the Assad regime, which doesn't, as Dana said, rise to the level of, well, there's this big gulf for us to exploit, uh, 
But clearly on the ground, there is this effort to sort of um, gain position against the other, looking especially, I think, towards a kind of post-conflict Syria where maybe there'll be some spoils to be had for these different parties. Um, and I think that if you look at the strategy, what they're trying to accomplish with this kind of suite of activities, um, I see two things really. One is to frankly just get something mm -hmm. out of this conflict in Syria to sort of turn a profit as it were, given the immense, uh, maybe not immense, given the significant cost that each has borne trying to prop up the Assad regime. So they want contracts. Mm -hmm. They want their firms to be able to go in and do business in Syria and to receive whatever economic reconstruction funds are coming from Europe in the West uh, in some future scenario. But I think there's another purpose, which is to use Syria in both cases, Russia and Iran, as a platform to project power. Um, for Russia, I think that means sort of into the Mediterranean. Uh, obviously, Russia has put a premium on maintaining its naval facility, uh, as well as its uh, air base, um, which it's expanded and consolidated throughout this conflict. Uh, and for Iran, I think that means, again, trying to sort of really embed itself in a way which expands its front against Israel in particular. Um, you know, one of the things we did was travel to the region, and if you look across the border from Israel into Syria, in just one Syrian town, you can see, um, literally see, a Hezbollah presence. You can see IRGC a bit further away from the border, um, and you can uh, see um, or at least hear about, um, the local militias, which are not Lebanese, they're not Iranian, they're actually Syrians, residents of the village perhaps, um, who are beholden to Iran on the Iranian payroll. And so there's this multi-layered approach that the Iranians have taken, which is actually sort of playing out right in front of us. Yeah. And, and is it, from both of you, is it your sense that this is a concerted effort on both these actors' parts to use, as Mike put it, the suite of tools uh, to further their interests, or are they trying as catch can, um, you know, to see in certain communities what sort, sort of tactics might work? Is, is it a grand strategy or is it more at the tactical level? Well, in the case of Iran, certainly the Iranians have shown themselves adaptable to the local context. So, so what they're doing, for example, in the Deir Zor area is different from how they've approached communities in southern Syria, which is different from how they've approached communities in the suburbs of Damascus. Um, different communities need different things, have experienced different levels of conflict uh, as it relates to the, the broader conflict. Um, and so the Iranians are adaptable. Yeah. Over to you, Sir Russia. No, I, I think it's, it's a good question, and I don't know that we know the answer. Yeah. Um, you know, it's easy to ascribe to any adversary, uh, and I think Russia and Iran particularly get this, um, a, a sort of a strategic genius that may in fact not be there. I, I think that there is some element of planning, of intention, which sort of goes into these activities. I'm sure there's also some opportunism. Um, and I'm sure that there's, in some ways, activities uh, or sort of obligations that both Russia and Iran have uh, sort of found themselves taking on that maybe they didn't want to or, or even right. intend to. So I, so I think it's a mix of these things. And I should also say, I think there's probably a lot we don't know about Russian and Iranian gray zone activities in Syria. But one of the things we recommend in the Syria study group report, and I should note that Melissa was also uh, an extremely valuable member of our Syria study group, um, is that really the US government needs to focus a bit more on these things, on exposing what Russia and Iran is doing, which means you first have to know what they're doing, which means there's also an intelligence component yes. to this. And I would personally like to see the State Department um, and others maybe sort of invest a little bit more um, in whether it's sort of internal resources or external resources, trying to shine a light on this area, because I think there's just too much that we don't know, frankly. Right. Great. Um, so we spent a concerted effort over the last few months uh, producing this report. And then uh, in early October, a series of decisions uh, have happened that have shaped uh, the, the battlefield, at least, uh, dramatically, um, introducing uh, additional factors into the equation. Um, just leave it there. Um, but given recent US decisions on Syria, um, what sources of leverage do we have going forward? Uh, given Russian and Iranian gray zone activities, the broader sweep of the conflict, what do you think still holds uh, from our report or your reflections in light of recent decisions in terms of the sources of US leverage, next steps that we should be taking? So first, let, uh I'm just going to give you the, the one minute spiel on what the report did recommend prior Please. to the last month's <laughs> decisions and developments. Um, we, we argued in our recommendation section that taken as a whole, 
even though the United States, that there's limited appetite domestically here or on the Hill to match the level of resources or even diplomatic investment of the Iranians and the Russians in Syria, that the United States still had compelling forms of leverage on the table to shape an outcome that was more conducive and protective of U.S. interests. And we identified four. So the first one was the one-third of Syrian territory that was owned via the U.S. military with its local partner, the Syrian Democratic Forces. Now, this was a light footprint on the U.S. military, only about 1,000 troops over the course of the Syria Study Group's report. And then the tens of thousands of, of forces, both Kurdish and Arab, under the Syrian Democratic Forces. And that one-third of Syria is the resource-rich, it's the economic powerhouse of Syria. So where the hydrocarbons are, which obviously is very much in the public debate here in Washington these days, as well as the agricultural powerhouse. But we argued that it wasn't just about this one third of Syrian territory that the US military and our military presence owned, both to fight ISIS and also as leverage for affecting the, the overall political process for the broader Syrian conflict. There were three other areas of leverage. One is political and diplomatic isolation of the Assad regime. This is, in our, in our assessment, one of Russia's goals in, in the Middle East is the propaganda win for Russia of rehabilitating Assad on the international stage, of basically forcing the international community to normalize him and welcome him back in without any behavioral changes. So holding the line on diplomatic isolation, preventing embassies from going back into Damascus. Two is the economic sanctions architecture. So some of this is part of the maximum pressure campaign of the Trump administration on Iran, but there's a whole suite of both executive and congressional sanctions on Syria and Bashar al-Assad, both for human rights abuses in Syria and to the backers of Assad for their activities on support, in support of him in Syria. And three was reconstruction aid. So the United States remains the overall largest single donor of humanitarian aid to Syrians both inside Syria and refugees outside of Syria. And there was some stabilization assistance in the part of Syria that was liberated from ISIS and controlled via the Syrian Democratic Forces in northern and eastern Syria. The rest of Syria, though, is, is rubble. And what the Russians want and what Assad wants is economic reconstruction. Um, and that is something that the United States can basically hold a card on via the international financial institutions and our cooperation with the Europeans. So we argued that absent behavioral changes by the Assad regime, we should hold the line on preventing reconstruction aid and technical expertise from going back into Syria. So now in the past month, it looked like one of the most compelling forms of leverage, which was the U.S. military presence, was taken off the table quite fast. Now, as of this morning, the news suggests that maybe that military presence will stay for some period of time. Um, and the problem with this is no matter what the U.S. military presence is or isn't, at this point, a lot of the, the PR damage is done. So if you're trying to get allies and partners in Europe or otherwise to work with our U.S. military in completing the fight against ISIS, most countries are going to be unwilling or hesitant to contribute more than they already have because they can't plan on the United States because this is like the third time um, that decisions have come out of Washington in a rather unplanned manner about whether or not the U.S. military is staying. Mike and I have argued recently that the other forms of leverage remain compelling if resourced effectively and prioritized at the highest levels of the U.S. government. So if we're going to hold the line on the diplomatic isolation, on moving forward with the economic sanctions architecture and holding the line on reconstruction aid, perhaps those things could still be compelling because in our view, what our assessment was of the conflict has not changed. The conflict is not over, it's entering a new phase. ISIS is certainly not defeated no matter what you hear from certain um, houses of a certain color here in Washington, D.C. Uh, the Russians very much remain committed uh, to Bashar al-Assad, as do the Iranians. Refugees are not returning home, certainly not in a safe, voluntary, or dignified manner. Um, and international norms are still being smashed every day by uh, the civilian protection issues taking place in Syria. Great. Mm. Mike, we're going to go to you and then a brief round of Q&A uh, from the audience. Sure. I, I'll keep my answer brief because I uh, largely agree with what Dana had to say. I, I think, you know, if I could sum it up, I would say we still have a lot of leverage on paper. It seems like our military is still there, although it's, you have to track this from day to day now, it seems. Um, and I will say that I sort of, I, I've been critical of the decision to withdraw. I think it was the wrong decision. Um, but 
and I do think that in a sense it's a win for Russia and Iran and the Assad regime, but I think that case can be overstated. Um, I don't think that Russia, the Assad regime, Iran now have sort of an easy path to victory or even an easy path to consolidating control, uh, whether in northeast Syria or elsewhere. I, I think the big problem is that while we may still have leverage on paper, it's exactly what Dana said. Um, already, you know, after December 2018, when the president first indicated he wanted to remove troops, there was this sense you got in Europe especially of states saying, well, look, if the U.S. wants out, maybe it is time to change our policy, to, to deal with Russia, to, to end the sort of isolation of Assad, to, to start giving reconstruction money, not, as, not so much for purely political reasons, but because there was a worry that if Syria sort of remains in this kind of um, chaotic, sort of devastated state, mm -hmm. that that then creates conditions for all sorts of uh, security threats to arise, whether it's ISIS, whether it's Iran, and so forth. I think that will be even stronger now. So, so I think that even though we may have that leverage on paper, a lot of our friends will say, look, you know, you have, for example, this Astana process with Russia and Turkey and Iran. We're going to engage with that process. We're going to try to find the best kind of diplomatic way forward with Moscow, with Ankara, uh, and so forth. And sorry, United States, we're not going to sort of go along with what you want to do. Stemming that tide is going to be really hard. And so inside the Trump administration, they're going to need to decide whether they want to try um, or whether they want to shift policy and go that direction themselves. And I imagine there's a debate about that right now. And we will see how that plays out in the coming days, I'm sure. We're going to do some brief Q&A with Mike and Dana before we uh, shift to the second part of our discussion. We have CSI staff members on hand with microphones. Um, so if you could please raise your hand when I call on you, please state your name and affiliation and keep your question to an actual question. Sir, right over here. Um, Alexey Hlebnikov, Russian International Affairs Council. Thank you for insightful and very uh, detailed um, presentations. and. Uh, I was really surprised to, to learn that Iran actually has a soft power in Syria. It's uh, very encouraging for, for Iranians to do that. Uh, but uh, my, my, my question is uh, about the <clears throat> entire methodology which uh, you used about uh, gray zones in Syria. So you largely focused on Russian and Iranian activities. What about Turkish and US activities in the same zones? I think we also cannot neglect that part because you know everyone uh, of those actors are part of this uh, conflict and equation. So, and we need also to look uh, in more details on uh, what those activities are and where could they lead. And the second question, just very brief, uh, what do you think are conditions at which U.S. Uh, military could finally withdraw, not only from northeast but also the uh, south Atanf area, where currently also quite um, substantial presence? Thank you. Great. And we're going to have a broader conversation on the other gray zone actors in our second part of our discussion. But if you guys want to jump in with some initial thoughts. So we talk about the conditions in our report under which we should consider withdrawing U.S. forces. And one of them is the sustainable defeat of ISIS. And we spend a lot of time talking about and deliberating on what that looks like. And what we say is that it's when, when communities liberated from ISIS are resilient enough to deter or push away ISIS attempting to reinvest in those communities. So a perfect example or a perfect storm is what's happening right now. Most of those communities um, are not stable are not, and are, did not receive stabilization assistance effectively. So we called, for example, for the U.S. administration to turn that stabilization assistance back on. It was frozen um, in 2017. So explosive ordinance is not being collected. Local councils uh, have not had the space to, to return services or th those sorts of things um, or, or protect themselves. And now as the SDF has focused on on moving north uh, into northern Syria to protect their own communities um, from Turkish military operations. A lot of those communities are uncovered, number one. And two, there's not a lot of talk about the Arab elements of the Syrian Democratic Forces and the Arab communities in eastern Syria. And right now, um, if we don't think also about what that means for the areas that were liberated from ISIS, and their choices are basically ISIS or the Assad regime, well, they know what life was like under the Assad regime, uh, and it's not something that they desire, or at least the, that's what the reports are that we understand. And that means that ISIS is going to have a new opportunity to reentrench itself in those communities. Hmm. Um, as, so as Melissa said, there will be more discussion about other gray zone actors. 
only say about the United States, I wish we were better uh, at these types of activities, at sort of activities short of conventional warfare. Um, part of our difficulties in Syria have been that we haven't really been willing to put resources in, um, even the resources that Congress has appropriated over the past several years haven't been spent. And so I think that has actually undermined our ability to have influence um, in different areas of Syria. We had, for example, in the past, more influence in southwestern Syria, but that was largely withdrawn. And so this is not, I think, um, a, a, a sort of arena in which we have competed well uh, with those uh, we're theoretically trying to compete against. On the troops, the only thing I'll add is that there's going to be a domestic political component to this as well. Um, we have an election uh, next year. Our military presence in the Middle East is, uh, I think, not one of the 10 most popular things uh, on the list of foreign policy matters for uh, the Democratic candidates. Um, and there'll be questions that arise about our continued presence there as to whether the mission is one which is properly authorized, whether it's one which is worthwhile. And I think we'll see that, that play, out, play out here in Washington as well. And I think it's important to note that the gray zone tools that we're talking about <clears throat> are typically non-military in, in nature. Um, there's been a very conscious effort to focus on the military dimension, but there's a, clearly a wider sweep of activities that are taking place and where there are clear gaps from some of these actors. Um, take a question perhaps from this side of the room and then we're going to shift to, unless there aren't any, uh, there's a sir here in the front row. Thank you. Uh, Steve Winters, uh, independent consultant. Um, I, I wonder, uh, so the, the question is, uh, how, how do you all assess uh, Putin's ability to influence uh, or tell Iran what to do uh, in Syria? And uh, a couple of weeks ago at this uh, Valdai uh, discussion group in Sochi, this question was asked to Putin, uh, you know, why don't you uh, suggest to the Iranians that they just get out of there and it, they're being very helpful. And, and I don't go along with his answer, but what he said was, hey, look, why are you asking me this? They're a sovereign state. I don't tell them what to do. They make their own decisions. That's, uh, and yet, at the same time, he was, uh, Putin was the one who brokered this uh, with, you know, a stand back from the uh, Golan of, of the Iranian troops. So what's your assessment of this? Um, so I, I don't think that the Russians can tell the Iranians what to do. I mean, I think they have a partnership. I think that partnership is mutually beneficial. Uh, the Iranians provide, help to provide sort of the ground forces. The Russians have largely provided the air uh, power. Plus, I mean, that's an oversimplification, but, uh, but maybe a useful one. And so, so they have needed each other. They don't have the same political aims necessarily, but their aims are close enough that they're compatible, I would say. Um, and when it comes to things like the, the Golan Agreement, I assume that when Iran agrees to these things, if in fact it has, I have my, my doubts as to whether this is actually the case, um, it's, it's because Iran sort of finds it to be advantageous for itself. Um, so, so I don't think that we're, if, we're, if our idea is we'll conduct diplomacy with the Russians, the Russians will force the Iranians out, I think that's a pipe dream. It's not going to happen. The Russians don't have that capability. Um, and we, would, we will need to find other ways uh, to try to put pressure on the Iranian presence in Syria other than just the diplomatic route with Russia. Do you want to add to that? The Russians have attempted over and over to uh, commit the Iranians to agreements that the Iranians have consistently violated. Over and over you've seen um, the Israelis hope that the Russians could deliver certain actions by the Iranians and they have never held up. Great. Um, so on that note, um, <laughs> we are going to thank you so much to, to Dana and Mike uh, for, for sharing your, your thoughts and insights um, and the findings, I think, um, still sadly ring true in terms of uh, the Syria Study Group report. There are copies of the report available today um, at, at the front check-in desk, um, so I encourage you to, to pick up a copy if you haven't already. At this stage, uh, we're going to transition to the second part of, of our conversation, um, so forgive us while we do a quick set change um, and we will get started in a couple of minutes. Thank you.
so just a second. <laughs> All right, everyone, um, thank you so much for your attention for the first part of our conversation. We're now going to um, shift to the second part of our conversation to, to broaden this discussion of uh, gray zone activities in Syria. Dana and Mike, um, I think, framed up uh, quite nicely some of the, the Russia and Iran dynamics, um, some of the recent developments. Thank you very much. Um, some of the recent developments uh, related to U.S. policy decisions and the impacts on, on northeastern Syria and how um, Ar Russian, Iranian, and U.S. Um, activities are intersecting in that particular part of the country. But this is a complex and continually evolving uh, conflict. Um, and so delighted to have uh, be flanked on both sides by, by experts who are coming to this issue from, from di different junctures. Um, to my left is uh, Ibrahim Alassil, who's a non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute. He's also a founding member of the Syrian nonviolence movement. Ibrahim previously led an initiative to train Syrian activists about strategic planning and project management, conducted studies in northern Syria on civil society in the region, and served as a fellow at the Center for Public Leadership at Harvard Kennedy School. Ibrahim him. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, to my right is Soner Chaptai, um, who is the Bayer Family Fellow and Director of the Turkish Research Program at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, a historian by training. Uh, he has taught courses at Yale, Princeton, Georgetown, and Smith. He has previously served as a uh, professor at Princeton University's Department of Near Eastern Studies and chair of the Turkey Advanced Area Studies Program at the State Department's Foreign Service Institute. Great to have you, Soner. And uh, to my far right is uh, my colleague here at CSIS, uh, John Alterman, who is a senior vice president and the Brzezinski Chair in Global Security and Geostrategy and director of the Middle East Program. He previously served as a member of the policy planning staff at the State Department, special assistant to the Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs, and is an expert advisor to the congressionally mandated Iraq study group on which uh, the, the model for the uh, Syria study group was, we was fixed that problem. Yes, <laughs> clearly, and now it's on, on to Syria, sadly. Um, so, so thanks to, uh, to you all for, for joining us. We had also uh, expected to have uh, Lieutenant General Charlie Cleveland uh, joining us today from, from West Point. He is unfortunately under the weather, uh, but I'm sure we'll be engaging on these issues going forward. He was also a member of, of the Syria study group. Um, so, so to kick things off, uh, Ibrahim, perhaps I'll, I'll turn to you uh, first. Um, as Dana and Mike laid out uh, some of the dynamics related to Russia and Iran's course of activities, um, in, in Syria, given your experience uh, working on the ground there um, and, and closely with uh, local governance and, and advocacy groups, how have uh, these Russian and Iranian activities that have been kind of described at more of a policy level affected the trajectory of the conflict? Uh, thank you, Melissa. So Iran and, and Russia, they intervened at different stages of the conflict uh, to achieve some, sometimes like their, their goals converged and sometimes uh, diverged. For, for Iran, first of all, when, when Iran started its uh, intervention in Syria, whether directly through the IRCG or, or through Hezbollah, it took the, the conflict from the local level to the regional level. And it certainly catalyzed the sectarian uh, factor uh, and dimension of the conflict. I, I remember in 2013 and 14 when I used to, to um, uh, visit Eastern Aleppo and talk to people and activists there, how the, the, the discourse uh, of, of people there started to change, especially after uh, Al Qusair uh, battle when Hezbollah intervened uh, in Syria and people started to identify more as Sunnis. Uh, more than anything else uh, uh, in those areas. And when I, I was working with some uh, young uh, guys there and I told them like, you never said you are a Sunni. Like since when you say I am Sunni, you don't, it was Ramadan and they mm. don't even practice. They were not fasting, they were smoking. And they said, B because that's how they look at us. They are here to fight us because they are Shia, we are Sunni. And then started to perceive the conflict through that lens, even though it wasn't how they perceived it in, uh, in 2011. Uh, for, and of course, Iran provided the manpower in the regime. When Russia intervened and it provided the, the air power to the regime, it also provided the sense of impunity. 
mm. uh, to the regime and to the forces loyal to the regime inside Syria. And we started also to feel that in the level of violence because Russia at that point in 2015 moved from being what you could call an accomplice to being a partner in the fight and to kill people inside Syria by Russian air power, people, civilians uh, inside Syria uh, on the ground. And of course, it also took the conflict from the regional level to the global or uh, the international level. And, um, uh, and I think Dana mentioned uh, the propaganda, the Russian propaganda. We absolutely feel it as Syrian civil society, as, as people who work on, um, uh, on Syria and, uh, and, and uh, supported uh, uh, the Syrian uprising uh, since 2000, 2011. It was totally different when you are facing the regime or the Iranian propaganda when you move to, to the Russian propaganda. It's much more powerful. It's, it's, it's stronger. It's deeper. Try to write sometimes anything on Twitter, even if you are secular, even uh, uh, if you are peaceful, you will get your Al-Qaeda, you are terrorist, even they went after the white helmet. They tried to deprive the Syrian uprising from any civil narrative. And that was very, uh, uh, like the damage was very deep uh, on, Syria, uh, uh, on the Syrian uh, movement. So Iran and Russia, they needed each other. They needed uh, each other. Uh, and, and while they both probably achieved a lot in propping up the regime, their strategic goal of limiting the US uh, influence and presence in Syria and in the region uh, hasn't been achieved yet. So they still need each other to, to achieve that um, in the future. It's incredibly dynamic. Thank you so much for, for unpacking that for us. Uh, John, I'd like to turn to you in terms of you know, pulling back and you know, the question that we, we started to tackle earlier with Dana and Mike in terms of is this actually a strategy um, that, that Iran and Russia are pursuing, uh, you know, the, the effects that Ibrahim has d described, or is it, is it just a bunch of tactics? Um, first, I want to congratulate you and Dana and Mike for a really excellent report, um, and thank you for having me. And I, I think I just want to start by underlining one of the things Ibrahim said that I think is really important. This didn't start off as a sectarian conflict. And it was partly a willful effort by the Assad government to turn it into a sectarian conflict to try to build international support. So it's an instrumentalization of sectarianism, which is a choice that was meant to preserve the Assad government, which in fact has been largely successful. So let's keep that in mind. I think the other piece of this is it, it's easy to assume that we have goals in Syria and the Russians have goals and the Iranians have goals and they're sort of all in a par. I, the Iranians start off with a pretty basic goal. They want to preserve a government in Syria that's friendly to them for a whole bunch of reasons, partly because Syria helps them access Hezbollah. Syria gives them a presence in the Levant. Syria means we can fight them there so we don't have to fight them at home. It gives, Syria, it gives Iran a way to deter Israel in some ways, gives them something to bargain with with Israel. So they weren't actually, I think, trying to achieve any particular outcome in Syria. They were trying to prevent a very particular outcome, which was the collapse of this government and the rise of some government that's hostile to them. I think the Russians similarly came in. It looked like the regime was going to topple. And the Russians came in and with a very modest military force of maybe 5,000 soldiers and a couple dozen fixed-wing aircraft were able to save the Assad regime for a whole series of their own particular reasons. We come in, we have our 80-country coalition. We're not really sure exactly what we're trying to do. In some ways, we want to talk about big stuff. We're going to rebuild Syria. We're, we're trying to sort of move toward a model of Syria that actually works and doesn't breed radicalism, but it's a lot more ambitious than what either the Russians or the Iranians were trying to do. And in point of fact, we never resource that. If we could even do it, we don't resource it enough to do it. Where it leaves us is we had a policy that late in the Obama administration, friends of the administration looked at me, in the Defense Department looked at me and said, I don't know where our desired end state in Syria is. I can tell you the Russians and the Iranians had a pretty particular low bar end state, which they have achieved. 
we had a sort of fuzzy high bar end state, which I think gets us into this space where the president says, not only are we not going to do reconstruction, we're not going to do stabilization. And I don't know anybody who's been involved in counterterrorism in any serious way who thinks that if you have a terrorism problem, if you don't do stabilization, you're not going to have a bigger terrorism problem. I mean, you can, you can have an argument about reconstruction. You can't have an argument, in my mind, honestly, about not doing stabilization, and we're not doing stabilization. There's a bigger problem, and they'll shut up. There's a bigger problem about US policy that nobody, nobody is beginning to talk about what reconstruction of Syria will look like and when and who's going to pay for it. And if we don't begin to have that conversation, and if we can't begin to influence the way in which it goes, we're not toward the end of the Syria problem. We're at the end of the initial phase of the Syria problem. And we're going to have decades of Syria problems that affect us and our allies for years and years to come. Yeah, and it's the current policy of the United States not to promote reconstruction in Syria. Or right stabilization. Now. Right, right. Um, I'd like to bring Soner into to the conversation. Um, it's a lot of attention on Turkey, particularly from, from Capitol Hill over the last few weeks. But to take a step back, um, you know, to look at what are Syria's strategic aims in the Syrian conflict and through what lenses do they look at Syria? Tur Turkey's aims. I'm sorry, right. Turkey, yes. Thank uh, ab you. Absolutely. And uh, thank you again uh, to you, uh, Melissa, and to CSIS and everybody for uh, having us here. And Congratulations also to you and Mike and Dana on the report and others who have contributed to it. Uh, I read it and I found it very useful. I recommend it uh, to everybody here. So I, I think that uh, Turkey's uh, objectives in Syria, uh, taking into account uh, nearly eight years of engagements since the beginning of the uprising, uh, I would say, except for the very beginning part of Turkey's involvement in which Turkey did the right thing, supported uh, pro-democracy movement, it failed, uh, it was ill-conceived and ill-executed, Turkish policy that is. It failed to take into account that the, uh, this pro-democracy uh, movement uh, morphed into a pro-democracy rebellion. And from then on, Syria went into a civil war, a sectarian civil war, a sectarian civil war that involved regional and global powers, a sectarian civil war that involved regional and global powers and jihadists. Uh, Ankara's policy uh, was frozen sort of uh, back in 2002 aiming to oust Assad as if none of this was happening at the same time. And I think that uh, uh, failure to uh, adjust or adapt uh, objectives to the realities on the ground uh, after 2012 left Turkey in the unenviable position of being hated by basically all sides by 2016. Ankara was hated by ISIS, by YPG, and by the Assad regime. So that allowed, I think, uh, uh, made it necessary for some adjustment. So after firing, then uh, his uh, foreign minister turned prime minister, Davutoglu, Turkish President Erdogan adjusted policy. And I think Turkey switched from just aiming to al-Assad to uh, undermining YPG. Um, I think that is, uh, that's also linked to Assad's own tactics. We've heard from my uh, uh, co-panelists about how Assad was able to masterfully sectarianize the conflict, bring outside actors in, but also he used uh, the YPG, knowing that uh, the PKK is Turkey's Achilles heel, very successfully against Ankara. Uh, Assad regime vacated uh, Kurdish majority areas of Syria in 2012. Uh, I made a trip to Syria in 2008 uh, solely for sightseeing purposes. At that time, uh, following 1998 uh, Adana Protocol between Turkey and Syria, Assad regime had promised to shut down PKK and ban its activities. But in 2008, I saw openly Ojalan posters, uh, PYD and YPG banners all over the country. So to me, it was a sign that this organization was very much tolerated. The regime allowed the YPG to surface in 2012 to distract Turkey uh, from its primary goal of ousting Assad. Erdogan ignored the YPG because there were peace talks with the PKK, uh, the YPG's mother organization at that time. Uh, these talks collapsed in 2015 and that uh, uh, raised the YPG's role or uh, threat level to Turkey. Uh, after firing Dautolo, I think Erdogan adjusted his form, uh, Syria objectives and it now became ousting Assad and undermining YPG. And I would say recognizing uh, the writing on the wall that the Assad uh, regime, if not Assad himself, is permanently staying, at least for the time being. Uh, 
uh, with the uh, you know, U.S. increasingly disengaging itself from Syria, Erdogan has now f completely focused on uh, YPG. I would also add that I've used the word Erdogan a lot. I think he's, uh, of course, he's a very powerful leader. He's Turkey's most consequential president in nearly 100 years since Ataturk established Turkey out of the ashes of the Ottoman Empire. But I think it's uh, simplistic, uh, it, uh, even when you use a shorthand to describe uh, what happened in Syria a few weeks ago as Erdogan's war. Uh, I think uh, the, the Erdogan clearly has some domestic objectives. I can uh, highlight them in the next round. But this is a war that is uh, in which Erdogan has uh, pretty broad support from wide constituencies. Although Turkey is very polarized, divided into two blocks, nearly half of the country loves Erdogan, the other half loathes him. Uh, hatred for the PKK and its outfits, including YPG, is quite a unifying concern. With the exception of People's Democracy Party, which is a Kurdish nationalist liberal alliance in the Turkish parliament, currently polling about 10%. All other parties in the parliament supported the war. So I would say this was a, uh, this has coalesced, the, this being uh, the, 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 the determination to undermine YPG and its political gains in Syria, and also to, to force the United States to consider its relationship with the YPG was an objective. I would say Erdogan has achieved the second, uh, meaning he has forced the U.S. to consider, at least he's done this in terms of his ability to convince President Trump uh, to reconsider that relationship. I don't think this is necessarily, uh, you know, we, we can't say this, there's a rupture necessarily between the U.S. and SDF, uh, uh, but many signs suggest that maybe uh, we're heading there. Uh, but I think his first objective of uh, il uh, undercutting and undermining YPG's political gains, that is um, all going to happen in the next uh, weeks and months as he now negotiates with the Assad regime through uh, uh, Russia uh, and I think this kind of requires, maybe we can do another round, but, but it's kind of a global handshake between Assad and Ankara, where Assad ha Ankara has to recognize Assad as Syria's government if Assad promises to take YPG under his control. And I'm sure Russia would love to, to broker yeah. that. Yeah. And I mean, the, the, the tragedy that, um, of, of all this is that I think, at least in what I have observed from experts like Sonair, um, who have been uh, you know, tracking this quite closely over the last few years, is that this was completely foreseeable. Uh, that, that Erdogan and, and Turkey have been quite transparent in terms of their, their intentions uh, for, for northeastern and northern Syria. Um, so just in terms yeah. of the U.S. government's calculus over, over the last few years. Um, yep. Um, Ibrahim, I'd like to turn back to you in terms of um, the, the impacts of the, the Turkish intervention and also reflecting on what we have seen in Afrin um, in, in prior years, what the reports that we're starting to see coming out of uh, northeastern Syria following the intervention, what are we seeing on the ground vis-a-vis uh, -vis Turkey's intervention, its reliance on certain actors, and what sort of effects that, that's having in the Syrian population? Um, it certainly does not serve uh, the, the interest of the Syrian people for, for the future. Uh, displacement, ha we, we've seen a lot of displacement, forced displacement throughout the, the Syrian conflict. Uh, it started in early actually in, in February 2012 in, uh, in Homs, one of the neighborhoods where displaced uh, Bab Amr by, uh, by the Syrian uh, regime and they were never allowed uh, to go back and then in, in areas around uh, Damascus also by uh, by Iran and the regime and then uh, in the north in Afrin by uh, by the Turks um, and and that's definitely where we're like planting the seeds for for conflicts in in the future when we put communities against each yeah. other when it comes to Turkey I believe that Turkey could and should play a constructive role in northern Syria between Idlib and the areas, the other areas, uh, uh, the Euphrates Shield, we have around 4, 4.5 million Syrians. In Turkey, we have around 3.5. That brings up up to 8 million Syrians. That's almost equal to the number of Syrians under uh, in the areas under the regime control. So there is a lot of responsibility in, uh, uh, on Turkey uh, for that matter. But, however, I don't think the intervention that just happened serves, it, it certainly serves uh, uh, President Erdogan's interest, but not the Syrian 
uh, interest. Uh, the conflict between Arabs and Kurds started in early mid 60s when mm -hmm. the Ba'ath regime started to displace Kurds uh, with, uh, and created what's um, uh, known as the Arab Belt mm -hmm. in northern Syria to uh, separate the, the Kurds in, uh, in southern Turkey from the, uh, uh, the Kurds in, in northern Syria. And that uh, created uh, part of the conflict that we see today. Mm -hmm. So we can imagine what's happening now, how long, as John just said, how this is just the initial phase mm -hmm. uh, of the Syrian uh, uh, conflict. And when we talk also about areas uh, under the regime control, uh, the, Iranian, the regime, with support from the Iranians, they wanted to displace big communities around Damascus and in, in other areas uh, in southern Syria to make sure that even if they lose their military presence in Syria, they won't lose the social uh, depth uh, uh, inside Syria to maintain uh, their influence uh, in the in the future, uh, and uh, and of course uh, also that was supported uh, by by the Russians and even uh, actually with the supervision from the U United Nations when we 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 witnessed the, what's called the reconciliation. Mm -hmm. So we have the forced. Uh, displacement and then part of the displacement was under the uh, reconciliation uh, deals uh, where we've seen Shia villages in the north being displaced by Ahrar al-Sham in, uh, in the opposition and also Sunni uh, uh, towns in Zabadani and Madaya displaced by uh, the Iranians Hezbollah and, uh, uh, and the Syrian regime. And the third way uh, of displacing people by the regime and also support from the Iranians is, is real estate development project mm -hmm. in Damascus and around it where so you have a lot of uh, communities that they were underprivileged and uh, uh, they revolted against the regime and were displaced so to make sure that they won't be able to come back uh, many of the uh, development projects there were given to businessmen related to uh, connected to the regime and they are developing luxurious uh, uh, real estate projects there with part of the, uh, some of the units in the project around Maze is quartered to half a million dollars to start with and that was a very poor area. So that way they will make sure even through that the real development, uh, the real estate development projects that those communities won't be able uh, to come back even if in the future under any deal they decide they want to go back to, to the areas under the, the regime control. Yeah. So it's it's not just the the forcible displacement of people, but it's it's these coercive measures, right. the the development, the the reconstruction to push people out of certain areas uh, and make it disadvantageous for them to continue to exist right. in in these areas. Done by different labor. regional uh, players. Like right. We, yeah, we've seen it in by Turkey and Afrin. We've seen it in Iran across uh, across the country. Right. And and to but different scale, just to to, right. to be honest, I mean, yeah. No, to, and that's to, to, that's to a good accurate. analytical point. Thank you for that. Um, and, and to connect to, to John's earlier comments about um, stabilization and reconstruction, you know, clearly these projects are being taken out uh, by Assad, by other uh, backers in in Syrian-controlled territory in a very deliberate way. Um, and you know, John, to turn to you in terms of how Assad, Russia are trying to court uh, regional players uh, to, to make investments or normalize relationships with the Assad regime to bring some legitimacy uh, to, to some of these projects. Um, how do you see those trend lines evolving? How successful is that outreach to the region and how is the region viewing some of these recent developments? Um, the region <coughs> concluded about a year ago that Assad had won. And the real debate is not over whether Syria will be readmitted to the, to the Arab community, but under what conditions and at what speed. Um, you know, even the Israelis didn't really have a problem with Assad. They, they felt that they had deterred, they know how to deter Assad. Assad is clearly deterred by the Israelis. They would much rather deal with Assad than a bunch of Salafi jihadis who want to march on Jerusalem because they know a lot of things about Bashar al-Assad, and one of which is he doesn't think he's ever going to march on Jerusalem. Um, so yeah, I think there's a way in which we've had a discussion about Syria, which is divorced from the discussion of people in the region who live with it, who say Assad is there. And, and so you know, the Emiratis opened a consulate. And, and there's a sense that over time, Assad will come back into the fold. How, when, 
whatever. They, they'd like the Iranians to have less of a footprint. And that's one of the things they'll push for. There, there's a, a sort of dictum that I hear a lot, especially when I go to the Gulf, that the Iranians control four, four Arab capitals. And that's Beirut, Damascus, Sana'a, and Yemen, and Baghdad. Um, they, of course, don't control any of those capitals. They have influence in all those capitals. And then the Gulf Arabs are going to try to push for ways to reduce Iranian influence. They think the way to reduce Iranian influence is to have more Arab influence. So I think this is going in that direction. Um, how fast it'll go, you know, partly it, it depends where they think the United States is going to be. I mean, they would love to understand where American policy is so they could mostly be helpful and then sometimes, you know, cut a corner or, or play off against it. But, but frankly, a lot of our, our allies, and it doesn't just, doesn't just apply to the Middle East, they can't figure out what we're trying to do, so they can't figure out how to help us, and they can't figure out how to coordinate their policy because they don't have a U.S. policy to orient around. So, so I yeah. sense, I mean, a, a really unusual amount of hand wringing, uh, not about eventually what will happen to Assad, but how they can figure out how to do it without some sense of how and when the United States is going to move so they can move in concert, because yeah. they certainly don't want to move without us. And, and with that lack of clarity on what the U.S. position is, it, how is that advantaging Russia? And how has Russia attempted to reach out to some of these regional so, players, uh, I mean, if I, at all? I, okay. Sometimes when it's really quiet and you listen really carefully, I think I can hear Vladimir Putin laughing here in Washington, because he's, I mean, he's, he's not put forward a lot of resources. And everybody assumes that Russia is ascendant in the Middle East. He just showed up in Saudi Arabia, signed billions of dollars worth of deals, he was feted, he went to, to the UAE, he was feted. There's this sense that Russia is on the rise, they just got themselves uh, two bases in Syria, which they never had before, you know, like serious long-term leases on these bases, they have an air base now. Um, there's this, they're deepening their ties in Egypt. Everybody wants to talk to the Russians and nobody can figure out the US. And I said, what's remarkable is when you think how little the Russians have spent to get that degree of influence and how much we are continuing to spend and get so much less influence. I think there's a sense, to my mind, the Russians have the advantage of knowing what they're trying to do, and it's very limited. And we have the disadvantage of wanting to do everything and not, not even resourcing basic things. And the region looks and says, well, we should talk to the Russians, we should talk to the Chinese, we should figure some of this out. But, but there's a sense that you can't build around a relationship with the United States. And the most damaging thing from an Arab perspective, and I was in Cairo a couple of weeks ago, the most damaging thing from an Arab perspective about what the president said about withdrawing from Syria had nothing to do with what he said about the Kurds. It was all the gratuitous talk about nothing but blood and sand, and we put $8 trillion into the region, got nothing from it. And every Arab government that thought it had put decades and decades into building a cooperative relationship with the United States was put on notice that they better hedge against the United States walking away fast and never coming back. And that has a real cost. Thanks, John. And, and so one of the actors that uh, is, is trying to make this calculation is, of course, Turkey, Sonair. Um, you know, and I think it's, there are some lessons to be drawn just not only about the bilateral relationship between US and Turkey, which we will see how, how that evolves or devolves, rather, uh, in, in the next several months um, with the congressional action and choices the administration might make. Um, so there's lessons about the bilateral relationship, but I think there are also lessons about in these competitions that the United States is going to be engaged in with Russia, Iran, potentially further afield with, with China, um, how does the U.S. navigate its relationships with allies and partners? And what are the choices that our allies and partners are going to have to be confronted with, particularly with a lack of clarity around U.S. policy? 
So I, I would say, uh, uh, you know, this has been an unusually uh, tension-filled period in U.S.-Turkish relationship, and I think this is um, basically how the relationship is going to be for a while. Um, that's because I think uh, confidence between institutions, and both capitals, has eroded. And not just uh, because of the events of the last few weeks, but uh, if you take into account uh, what has transpired uh, between Turkey and U.S. Uh, since uh, Turkish President, uh, previously Prime Minister Erdogan, came to power, uh, U.S. and Turkey had sharply differing strategic objectives in wars in two of Turkey's neighbors. In Iraq, uh, 2003, the U.S. wanted to do a lot and Turkey wanted to do a little. And in Syria, uh, Turkey wanted to do a lot and U.S. little. And on top of it, of course, U.S. allying with uh, YPG, an offshoot of PKK, uh, which is not only a terror-designated entity, but Turkey's sworn enemy. And Turkey making alliance with uh, radicals to fight the Assad regime, uh, which is a sworn enemy of the United States, has only, I think, left behind a really a bitter taste. And then specifically, I think, uh, uh, a lot of people are angry at uh, Ankara because of uh, the fact that Turkish incursion upset U.S. plans uh, to work with Turkey to set up a safe zone that would have uh, brought forward YPG moving away from the Turkish border without bringing the Assad regime and Russians in. So uh, that plan has collapsed. So uh, clearly not an easy uh, period coming up. But I would also add that Turkish President Erdogan is scheduled to come here for a meeting with President Trump. And I think Notwithstanding the other problem areas in the relationship, the Erdogan-Trump relation ties uh, relationship is one that works. I think they have quite good rapport. They get along. Uh, they have affinity for each other as strong men presidents. I was argued that Turkish President Erdogan is the Rorschach test of every U.S. president. Uh, you know, uh, I've, tr I've tracked Erdogan's career uh, for over two decades now. You know, President Bush saw in Erdogan uh, a faithful like himself with whom he could do a business. President Obama saw in Erdogan a window to the Muslim world, and uh, Trump sees in Erdogan a fellow a strong uh, president. So I think that will really yeah. uh, uh, continue to be the bedrock on which uh, uh, crises uh, we hope can be managed, upon which they can be managed. But um, of course, the uh, spoiler here is Russia, uh, which has significantly changed its Turkey policy. I would say almost an historic change. Uh, I've recently published a new book uh, called Erdogan's Empire, Turkey and Politics of the Middle East, if I can make a shameless plug. Congratulations. Thank you so Absolutely. much. So one of the arguments I make in this new book, uh, Erdogan's Empire, is looking at the historic Do you have free copies of, in the lobby for us all? I will sign them, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the historic Turkish-Russian relationship and that Russia is unique among Turkey's dozen neighbors, including maritime neighbors across the Black Sea, in the sense that it's the only neighbor that Turkey's afraid of because it's the only neighbor that has consecutively and conclusively defeated the Turks or Turks' Ottoman ancestors for over half a millennium in nearly a dozen and a half wars by my count. And uh, that was Russian policy. Russia was Turkey's nemesis that bullied Turkey. Uh, so when Russia deployed to Syria with Turkey uh, supporting rebels and Russia supporting Assad regime, it was the closest in my view they came to their 18th historic war. Uh, in which uh, it was clear that Turkey was going to lose if this war started. And when Turkey shut down a Russian plane that had violated its airspace from Syria, it looked like uh, in November 2015, it looked like this war was going to start. I think that six month period after that was incredibly tense. Uh, uh, Russia threatened to shoot down all Turkish backed forces and auxiliaries in Syria. It was almost as if Turkey was forcefully exiting the Syrian war. And then the uh, coup plot happened against Erdogan, uh, the failed coup plot. And, uh, nefarious affair, but I think uh, the Russian takeaway from it was masterful for Putin. With Russia went from being the nemesis that bullied, bullied Turkey from Catherine the Great to Putin the Great to becoming the nemesis that courts Turkey after July 2016. Putin reached out to Erdogan the next day. Uh, a Turkish friend tweeted and said he even offered to send uh, Russian special ops from a Greek island nearby. I don't know that Russia has special ops on a Greek island nearby, but you get the idea. Uh, and Putin also started to give Erdogan what he wants in Syria. He said, come in, take whatever you want from YPG. You can have Jarablus before the YPG takes over from ISIS. You can have Afrin from Jar uh, YPG. So I think Russian policy is now using Syria to peel Turkey and, of course, and Erdogan further and further away. And so uh, we will have uh, tough... Peel them away from NATO, right? Uh, and NATO, right. I think that's... For, for Russia, sometimes I think that Russia is... Prior, Putin prioritizes uh, 
uh, taking all of Syria back under Assad regime control. But that's more long term. Yeah. Short term is using Syria to peel Turkey away from NATO. Uh, because that's a big, Turkey is a bigger prize, uh, believe it or not, than Syria is. It's yeah. about NATO co uh, cohesion, uh, the alliance, uh, the transatlantic order. Uh, so I, I would say, uh, you know, I have faith in the long term durability of the US Turkish relationship. And I think in the short term, Erdogan Trump relationship is quite important. But Russia will always uh, play a spoiler because it will offer to Turkey more than what the U.S. is willing to offer, whatever that is in uh, Syria. It will always up the ante. And I think Erdogan has learned to uh, leverage Putin and Trump against each other. He goes to one and says, this is what the other side gives me. What can I get? So he got northwest Syria from Russia. And he got northeast Syria from the U.S. Uh, and I think he'll try to do more of that uh, on, on this visit. But of course, uh, I would always look at Putin's next moves if this is a chessboard going forward. Yeah, no, thanks for that. We, we're, I'm going to come back to you just with a quick follow-up, but we're going to move to questions and answers from the, the audience in just a moment. Uh, so please prepare your thoughts. Um, Sonar, just as a quick follow-up on that, if you could take a step back in terms of what are the lessons that we can draw uh, from this dynamic with the US, Turkey, Russia that might be applicable going forward for U.S. competitions with Russia, with China, with Iran? So I would say one uh, kind of um, immediate takeaway, for, especially from the events of the last few weeks, is that uh, Ankara was never going to accept and will never accept in the future, in my view, uh, in the absence of peace talks between Turkey and PKK. It will never accept a political entity aligned with uh, PKK in Syria. And so that's why I think Turkey prioritized undermining that entity uh, and all other Turkish goals in Syria, ousting Assad, uh, became subservient to that. Uh, that's the immediate takeaway, and I think it, but it will remain a Turkish objective in the absence of uh, uh, Turkish PKK peace talks. There's uh, no way, and I think um, the fig leaf uh, that the YPG is not the same as PKK, I think clouded decision making in Washington because people started to believe the fig leaf that it was true and they started getting upset if the Turkey was not accepting uh, the PKK's offshoot in Syria because the offshoot was not PKK. Uh, but uh, so that's I think important for us to not let uh, the legal uh, differences uh, between these two organizations cloud our decision making uh, because of the way that Turkey uh, uh, sees a threat from the PKK it means that it's transferred to the YPG in Syria as far as Ankara is concerned. Uh, and then another takeaway I would say is that whatever in Syria, whatever the doctrine that what happens in Syria stays in Syria completely failed uh, so with so many ramifications. Uh, the war in Syria has destabilized our allies, starting with Turkey. Uh, Turkey's war with, uh, uh, I think, um, uh, uh, peace talks with PKK, I can explain, collapsed uh, predominantly because of the success of the PKK Syrian outfit YPG. Uh, it did so well in Syria, took over towns in 2014, including Kobane, that the PKK thought it could repeat this model in Turkey, take over towns and declare autonomy. Uh, very short-sighted, in my view, for them to think they could defeat NATO's second largest military, but it also meant the end of peace talks. So clearly, I think there's an end. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a relationship between the way peace talks collapsed and the war in Syria happened. Uh, refugee uh, flows not only into Europe, but across Europe, uh, into Turkey, but across Europe uh, has been, played a big role in the rise of far-right parties. Uh, I think a big generational impact of the war in Syria will all have to suffer its consequences across Europe and the U U.S. Uh, uh, I think the rise of nativist populist leaders globally is linked, is not uh, uh, birthed by, but is linked to the 2015 refugee crisis. And, so I always think that you know, there are secondary effects of uh, Syria, Russia's engagement in Syria. Mm -hmm. If the first effect was uh, you know, prop up the Assad regime and make sure that he survived, because even Assad himself was saying in 2014 he wasn't sure he was going to be holding on to mm -hmm. Syria. That changed after Russian deployment. But uh, you know, as, uh, as Ibrahim mentioned, the Russian bombing of civilians, which, increasingly, uh, which significantly increased the regime's ability to incur uh, uh, you know, to do horrible things to civilian population is the reason why you had a sudden outpouring of ref, uh, refugees in 2015. People who uh, lived in Syria knew that until that moment, uh, because the Assad regime air force was not uh, completely capable, they were safe uh, if the weather was bad at night, uh, because their planes could not fly under bad weather at dark. Russians can do 24-7 uh, flights and bombing, and I think that triggered the uh, 
refugee movement. So clearly, maybe that was not Trump, uh, Putin's goal, but he got it. Uh, you know, refugees went from Turkey to Greece. Uh, Greeks and Turks fought. That happens. They went for, into Macedonia. Macedonians fought Greeks. That also happens. They went to Serbia. And then Austria. Germans fought Austrians. Danes fought Germans. Swedes fought Danes. When you can get Swedes and Danes argue, you've achieved something. Yeah. So. Yeah. John, you just, want to I just want just. Yeah. I, mean, I think it's an important point that, that what we've heard, right, is that the Russians and the Turks and the Iranians care a lot about Syria and have very limited goals. The United States cares a little bit about Syria and tends to have very expansive goals. How's that going to come out? Yeah. And, and if I may also, um, you know, to build upon your takeaways, Sonair, the importance of understanding our allies' priorities and, and interests clearly and then calibrating our actions and areas of convergence with them in our strategic approaches. Um, clearly, there's there's been a significant right. disconnect, but I think I that's agree. a clear uh, objective that we need to strive forward uh, going forward in, in these types of competitions. We're going to turn to Q&A with the audience, um, starting here in the front. If you could please uh, wait for a microphone and then stand and state your name and affiliation and uh, form your question in the form of a question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Angelita. Um, I'm a writer. I have a question with regards to the Shiites and the Sunnis. Because I think any peacemaking effort has to do with how people identify themselves. Because, I mean, even, in, and the, the thing is, it's, it's, it's a historical rivalry, actually, based on who's the legal heir to, to Muhammad or something. Leadership of the Muslim community. I'm sorry? The leadership of the Muslim community. Yes, right. to the leadership of the Muslim. So, I mean, even with, with the US foreign policies, I think if people, I mean, across the Middle East, that's the problem everywhere. I mean, the Shiites versus the, the Sunni identity. And unless I think people understand that very basic core conflict among Middle Easterns, I don't know how peace is possible. But, and then the other thing is, uh, I have a question with regards to the US foreign policy. I think the, the shortcoming, too, is that the administration is not seeing the bigger picture in terms of what what the U.S. really has to play. Right now, Putin is becoming the power broker in, in the Middle East. So, I mean, he can easily extend that reputation or that identity across. And and U.S. is competing for global supremacy. So it's kind of like Putin inching, inching, inching himself into competing with the, with the U.S. So uh, what's your perspective on that? A gray, zone, the, a gray zone approach, you. absolutely. So we'll start with Ibrahim. Sure. Yeah, so for the, uh, the Sunni-Shia conflict or, or disagreement or differences, it certainly goes back like around uh, 14 centuries. But uh, uh, I'm sure the Catholic and the Protestant conflict goes back probably uh, also for centuries. And, and also there is a lot of uh, blood that was uh, uh, spilled. However, religious differences, that, that is not and should not be translated into military uh, violence. Uh, I come from a family that um, uh, has Sunni background, uh, and in Damascus there is only one uh, Shia school that takes the, the money for tuitions and gives, uh, uh, gives the, that money to uh, uh, poor Shia. I went to that school in Damascus, and I studied there for five years. Uh, it wasn't a problem, and especially, by the way, in Syria, which is different than Iraq and Lebanon. The, the, the Sunni Shia split in Syria wasn't dominant in, 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 in the political history. There is a lot with the Alawites, which is also different, but we don't have time to go into that. But again, as I mentioned in, in my initial remarks, sectarianism in the Middle East is a tool, is not a root cause. The root cause is all the root cause is all the, the grievances and the, the uh, governance uh, uh, issues and uh, different regional players trying to fill the vacuum uh, by uh, uh, that was left uh, by also U.S. withdrawal and how they are trying to do it uh, in the future. But it's not the, the the sectarian differences between Shia and Sunni. And just to underline Ibrahim's point, which I think is 100% correct. Uh, 10 or 15 years ago, I was talking to a senior royal in the Gulf and tried to raise this issue of Sunni-Shia conflict. And he looked at me sort of like I was a slightly dim four-year-old and shook his head and said, you don't understand. The Iranians 
have only been Shia for 500 years. They've been Persians for millennia. <laughs> People use the Sunni-Shia conflict. <clears throat> Iraq used to be a majority Sunni state until the late 19th century when a large number of Iraqi Sunnis converted, if you want to say it, to, to Shia Islam. These, these, these boundaries are not fixed. I mean, Iran was a Sunni state until to fight the Ottomans, they converted to Shia Islam. These categories move and people use the categories to advance their own political agendas. Now, in terms of what Putin is doing, I think Putin has the advantage <clears throat> of starting from a relatively low base. So you can say Putin is doubling Russian spending, and it's still relatively modest. There is a sense that the US is on its way out, and so people are looking for how they're gonna hedge and what's on its way in. And so your options are the Chinese and the Russians. And so there's an openness to exploring things with Putin. I think because Putin has very narrow targets of what he's trying to do, that he's able to accomplish a lot of it because we have very expansive targets and not a lot of commitment and not a lot of resources we're putting into it. So I don't know how this sorts out in 10, 15, 20 years. My guess is Russia is not going to experience an economic miracle and that Russia will run out of gas. Gas, I mean, metaphorically, not in terms of <laughs> petroleum and hydrocarbons. Uh, but, you know, we're, what are we going to want and what are we going to do? And there's another, there's a serious question. How much should we be caring about the Middle East in 10, 15, 20, 30 years, which I think we should actually be having a discussion about instead of assuming, uh, because it relates not only to how we relate to the Middle East, it relates to how we relate to Asia and Europe and, and what our role in the world is. And I, you know, I'm hoping that this presidential campaign is going to distill some of the really serious policy discussions that we haven't had and really need to have. It, 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 we're going to go to somebody else next, um, but but also just to underscore Ibrahim's point about the, um, the really the drivers of, of these grievances. I think these protests uh, that are quite dramatic, uh, breaking out in, in Lebanon and Iraq, are a clear reflection of, of these grievances that are not sectarian in nature. Um, I worry about the counter-revolutionary forces that might use this opportunistically, but for now. Um, it's a clear expression of, of what you were speaking If I could just to. quick tag along yeah. um, 10, 30 seconds. I agree with John. I think it's reductionist but also escapist to suggest that these conflicts are driven by old hatreds and we can do nothing about it. 3,000 uh, years. Right. It reminds me of explanations of the war in Bosnia in the 90s when people would write about how Catholic, Orthodox and uh, Catholic Christians hated each other since the division of the Roman Empire into two. So you can always find something in history that divides, but there's also... Uh, more that uh, unites as an historian. I can't but comment on uh, John's point about how Iran became officially Shia in 16th century because it's the way uh, the dynasty, which was Turkic in nature, could define itself against the Ottoman dynasty, also Turkic in nature. So the Shahs and Sultans would write to each other in Turkish, calling each other dog, uh, <laughs> while you know trying to have uh, claims to legitimacy uh, using uh, sectarian identity. So I think these are manipulatable, but they're not at the core of the conflict, or nor are they historic. Great. Um, we're going to bundle a few questions together as we're running a bit short on time. We'll take this gentleman over here, um, so if you could please wait for a microphone. And then um, there's a gentleman in the back with the glasses. Yep. Keep the glasses. So yes, you know that's you. your distinguishing <laughs> feature. Hi, Thanks. thank you for the discussion today. My name is Barrett Alexander and I work at World Vision. As a humanitarian actor working inside Syria, um, several of the recommendations from the report are humanitarian in nature. Um, but given sort of the high-level statecraft discussion we've had, how do we um, boil down U.S. policy, uh, traditionally seen as a soft power, um, giving humanitarian aid abroad uh, as a way of increasing leverage inside Syria while also helping not only international NGOs, but local NGOs adhere to humanitarian imperatives? And then, sir. Yeah, I'm Phil Oldham with the Near East Foundation, and um, a lot has been spoken about Russia's goals, their objectives, and their strategies, but 
it seems like their primary motivator is just to poke a finger in the eye of the West. Is that not the underlying long-term goal, is just to thwart Western policy in the region? Or, or are they really motivated by their own self-interest to achieve something that is for the good of Russia itself? Would you like to tackle the humanitarian question yeah, first? I'm yeah. happy to take both. Yep. I mean, I th look, I think, to your question, the, the most important starting point is the word you used of leverage. I think Americans come into negotiations assuming that we have leverage because we're the United States. And we don't have to think about developing leverage. And what I've seen consistently <clears throat> since the conflict broke out in Syria is the US hasn't thought about how do we develop leverage. We assume we have it. We assume we don't have to husband it. We assume we don't have to direct it. And other people actually are developing leverage. And it turns out that they have more say than we do. Uh, you know, we, ha we built an 80-country coalition and couldn't figure out how to use that to promote the outcomes we wanted, except to say we have an 80-country coalition. So uh, to me, the, the core, the beginning point is to assume we have to look for ways to build our leverage as the starting point and then build out from there. In terms of the question about Russia, in some ways, Russia sees itself very much engaged in a zero-sum game with the United States in the Middle East. They think the United States is trying to, to, to hamper Russia's rightful global role, that we're trying to hem them in, and to the extent they can peel away NATO allies, to the extent they can become a genuinely global power. I mean, if you think we have a serious blue water navy, the Russians have a single aircraft carrier that spews smoke everywhere it goes. It's a disaster, right? I mean, they're not a near pure power, but they'd like to be considered a near pure power, and they consider themselves to be in a zero sum game with us. Uh, I think that, that as I say, their, their magic bullet is they often have very limited goals in a place like Syria, uh, and they're able to accomplish limited goals with limited costs, and that's what they can afford to do. And, we're not being thoughtful enough about what we need to do um, and, and how to accomplish what we need. And I think that gives the Russians opportunities to, to make inroads in a very small number of countries. If you think about it, Russia is not trying to expand throughout the Middle East. They're trying to make strategic investments, which is what they can afford to do. And they're being relatively successful, especially starting from a low base. So the percentage gain seems high. So, no, so, absolutely. so in terms of what uh, Putin is trying to accomplish, I mean, the list is quite long. Uh, prop up the Assad regime, uh, you know, peel Turkey away from the U.S., um, maintain a foothold uh, in the Eastern Med and Middle East. But also, I think uh, Putin's decisions early on to support Assad uh, were informed, as were President Obama's, in my view, by what happened to Gaddafi in Libya. <laughs> You know, Qaddafi's fall uh, with limited UN mandate given to those uh, countries backing his opponents, I think told Putin that he had to st be steadfast with uh, uh, Assad, not allow any kind of international action, action or sanctions. As I think uh, was the case for President Obama, Qaddafi's fall and how Libya splintered into 100 pieces worried him that Assad's fall could uh, bring forth, uh, forward the same outcome. But I think the outcome we had is uh, worse than Syria splintering into 100 pieces, it's splintered into 1,000 pieces. But to go back to Putin, um, uh, you know, how many of us thought uh, five years ago that Assad was going to be physically safe when car bombs were going off in Damascus? I mean, how many of us thought four years ago that Assad would survive politically? I think he's surviving and he's taking a lot of Syria under his control. So uh, by standing firm behind Assad, Putin's message to uh, all uh, dictators, uh, global bad leaders, bad guy leaders, is that it doesn't matter what you do. If, I, if you have my uh, support, you'll survive. So I think it is also a way of building allies among uh, leaders across the world, and uh, it's uh, working, of course. I think that's the message he's giving to populist leaders and uh, autocratic leaders uh, around the world. And then finally, to John's point about confusion in U.S. policy, I agree, and sometimes I think President Trump runs uh, three Twitter accounts under one handle. Uh, so I will call them ABC. I think A is for his base, uh, 
uh, B is for foreign leaders because this is how we negotiate with foreign leaders and C is to policymakers, including many of us in the room and those who are watching online. And I wish he tagged his tweets and said it's A and B and C and we would know who's, which is for who, but it doesn't work like that, of course. So. Ibrahim, did you want to weigh in on uh, this? Yeah, absolutely. For the um, quick comment on the humanitarian aid, it's absolutely very important as a leverage, but also uh, as a tool to help the local communities to be on their feet again. Uh, to, to prevent uh, the resurgence of, uh, of ISIS. I don't think if this is still possible at, uh, at this point, uh, but it's very important to stabilize the communities in the areas uh, where ISIS uh, was before. And whenever we talk about reconstruction, I'm, I'm totally against giving money to the regime for reconstruction because that money will be weaponized against local communities as a reward for the loyal mm -hmm. communities and the punishment uh, for disloyal uh, communities. However, if we want to help Syrians, there are areas outside the regime control that could at least be stabilized uh, so the refugees can go back to, to those areas so we can start in, uh, in those areas outside the regime control. And just to, as a point of clarification, because I do think these terms are, are uh, somewhat conflated at times, there is a distinction between humanitarian assistance, which should be apolitical um, and, and serving humanitarian purposes, um, and then stabilization and reconstruction, which are inherently political in nature. It, it may sound like semantics, but it matters in terms of being ac having access to vulnerable populations and servicing those basic needs versus um, empowering local elites and furthering the Assad regime. Um, so on that note, uh, I want to thank you all uh, for joining us today and helping us uh, better understand an incredibly complex conflict uh, with the overlay of gray zone competition. Many uh, lessons to be learned, um, not only in the Syrian context and what it pretends for, for US choices going forward. Um, what happens in Syria doesn't stay in Syria. Um, so further discussions to be had certainly in, in Washington and, and thank you all for, for joining us today and for the terrific discussion. Please join me in uh, thanking our panelists.